All right, okay, I think this is the this is the time, right? So now we're official live. If the video is gonna be posted, this is where it's gonna be posted from. More likely we're gonna do some cuts and sort of take out the bad parts. Um, but welcome uh, everyone. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is our first uh, live stream. We're gonna do a little demo. So I know the, the poster wasn't particularly clear about what exactly it is that we're going to be doing, but we're, <laughs> we're gonna show you uh, I'm going to be showing you some of the basics, and then Jason is going to sort of expand on that and show you, well, basically this uh, this dragon uh, that's flying around in the background. Uh, so he's going to be setting that up from scratch, or rather from having the puppet, like the, the rig, and then animating it to, to achieve a similar sort of look. Uh, and before we get there, I'm going to set you up with uh, the basics of Ragdoll. I'm going to assume that no one knows anything about Ragdoll and sort of take you up from the... Uh, from the ground up, basically. And uh, I think uh, that's pretty much it for a demo. I'm going to jump in. Well, oh, well, I haven't even introduced ourselves. Like, so, uh, right. So, I mean, <laughs> I am Marcus. I, so I wrote this thing. Uh, and then with me, I have Jason Snyman. He's going to use the thing uh, to, well, like I said, animate the dragon. And uh, uh, yeah, we're going to do like a little catch up afterwards. So we're, we're planning on half an hour. And then if there's questions and stuff, post it in the chat. And then the next half hour, we're going to catch up on that and like maybe like live demos and stuff and answer those questions and things like that. Um, right. And that, I think, is a good intro. Now we're going to do a little switcheroo over to my screen. And then I'll show you the basics. Uh, and then Jason's going to show, show you his version. Uh, let's see. I think... I think that is it. Uh, yeah, so someone let me know if you can't actually hear me uh, or see me, but, but you should be, it should be good now. So here's the, the scene I'm gonna be taking you through. Uh, I'm gonna start with applying some sort of physics onto just the gun, and then I'm gonna apply it to the whole character. Uh, and then from there, you'll have an understanding of how you interact with the system and how you get animation back, uh, back out. So uh, to start, I'm gonna delete uh, everything, like all the physics, uh, I'm going to delete all the layers that I made. So we're back with just like this character here, which has got some linear, some basic linear keys on it, uh, nothing fancy. Uh, and then I'm going to start with making the, like I mentioned, the weapon. I'm going to make that dynamic just to sort of start small, which is a single, a single transform. So it's got some animation on it. Uh, and I'm going to turn this into a marker. I'm going to assign a marker to it rather, so it's being it's being made physical by Ragdoll. And the default is that you just get the, the geometry of your controller is going to turn into this. Well, in this case, it's just a rectangle. Uh, that's not what I want. I'm going to use the mesh of the gun. So I'm going to go Ragdoll replace. And so now we have a simulated controller, but it looks like the weapon. So it, you know, it collides and reacts like the weapon does. But I don't want it to fall to the ground. I want to, I want to follow the animation uh, sort of in world space. So I'm going to set the, the gun to world. Uh, and now it's going to follow the weapon um, quite closely. So I'm going to lower the amount, say, quite significantly, and maybe make it a bit more jiggly, just to sort of extra exaggerate the effect, right? Uh, but the first thing I noticed that I don't really want it to uh, uh, be affected by gravity. I just want like an offset. I want my animation to just be a little bit offset by the physics. And <laughs> it's actually quite, maybe a bit, maybe a bit too much. Let me go 0.5, so something like that, something like that. It's ex exaggerated, but it's still a reasonable, uh, a nice sort of follow through. Uh, so the first thing that happens is that it goes through the body. So I'm going to try and fix that by making the body into a collider. So I'm going to assign markers onto the geometry here as well. And by default, it's going to try and simulate that, but that's not really what I want. So I'm going to make them kinematic, and that just means uh, take the animation and just copy it into the solver, so it just it does whatever the animation is doing. It doesn't. It's not affected by uh, gravity or forces or even contacts. It just like uh, well, other physics responds to it. So now you can see that you get the sort of a nice offset from the gun, and it's still like colliding with the body and respecting that. Uh, and so far, the original controller has uh, not been changed. Like it's unaffected. And in fact, if I just take the solver and I actually hide it, uh, then we're left with like nothing has actually changed. So all of the, the keyframes that you had and like all the controllers, they're, they're no, there's no connections to it. Uh, the, your channels and everything is still intact. 
Uh, so the way you would get it back onto the controller is to record it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna select the controller and I'm gonna run record and then it's gonna run through the simulation and basically parent constrain your control onto the simulation and then bake it. So then we're left with this. So now we have like, now we can hide the solver. We can even delete ragdoll and sort of get rid of everything. And in fact, that's what I'm gonna do. I'll just show you at first that it's on a layer. So you have your sort of baked simulation is on this layer here. So you can sort of toggle it on and off. Uh, but like I mentioned, I'm going to, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to take this a bit further. I'm going to apply physics to the whole character. So I'm going to delete everything again. I'm going to keep my layer, but I'm going to disable it for now. Uh, we can keep it like a, like a version, like a revision. And um, instead of applying it onto the control, I'm going to apply physics to the underlying skeleton. So I'll just do a sign and I'll sort of walk the hierarchy. So I'll assign it to the legs and the arms and build out a sort of dynamic hierarchy. So the default is that the, the first control that you select is going to be kinematic, it's going to follow the animation, and then the rest is just dynamic. So it's a bit messy. So if I just hide the joints, and so put the, we can put the solver on the side, just so we can see what we got. And that's pretty good. So from here, I'm going to do some tweaks. So I'm going to get to the manipulator. I'm just going to modify these shapes make them a bit more uh, similar to the, uh, the character. So something like this. And that's pretty good. So at this point, I don't really want the, the hip to be 100% animation. I kind of want it to have a little bit of freedom because uh, you can see it's still, it's still got those linear keys on it. Uh, so I'm gonna turn this not into a kinematic, but a dynamic. Uh, it's also gonna be in world space like we did with the gun. And already you should see there's a little bit softness to it. I'm gonna decrease the amount of influence. So now it's quite loose. It's, uh, and the feet uh, also, I want the feet to be, uh, the feet should be 100% animation. So I'm gonna lock those to whatever was animated, something like that. So we keep that sort of the sharpness of the animation. And uh, maybe I'll make the, the whole body a little less stiff. So I'll just reduce this value there we go. So now he's, uh, you know, properly dynamic, <laughs> if you will. Uh, the thing missing here, obviously, is the gun. So let me just add that back. Select the controller, assign to it, and replace. Uh, so obviously, he, he's still holding on to it, kind of, but it's not, like, there's not enough uh, <laughs> geometry or friction to keep the gun in his, in his hands. Uh, and even if he, you know, he doesn't really have fingers, so <laughs> it doesn't, it wouldn't really work. Uh, so in this case, I'm just gonna I'm gonna weld constrain the gun to the hand. So I'm gonna go to constrain and weld. Uh, take this one as well, weld. So I get these two weld constraints, uh, and they're just gonna make the gun sort of it's gonna make it one with the hand, so that he can't actually let it go. And that's pretty good. I would say from here, uh, because everything is sort of dynamic at this point. You can sort of start fooling around with the physics of it all. And it, you know, this is where I, I find it the most interesting to sort of see what you get. Uh, let's say if the weapon was actually twice as heavy, like I'll make it have a density of uranium, which is uh, it's probably more like 10 times more heavy uh, than flesh. And now the gun is a bit too heavy. So I'm gonna try and stiffen up the body, give him some, some more muscle. And that's uh, it's getting closer. He's probably a bit, still a bit too relaxed. All right, I'm going to just crank it up a little bit more. So now we have a, a reasonably uh, sort of crafty, sort of a, a tense body uh, and a quite a, a quite a heavy weapon. All right, and the final thing I'm going to do, uh, because let's say that at this point the director came along and said, actually, I don't want him to survive this bullet. Like, I, I want to, like, the direction has changed. Uh, I actually want him to, to get hit and fall over. Uh, that's, that, you know, that's, that's the new direction. Uh, so in that case, what I would do is I'd say that, say from here, uh, I'd like the head, uh, or rather the torso and the feet, the ones that are in world space and kinematic. I'm gonna say that at this frame, do whatever you're doing, but on the next one, I want you to go completely dynamic. Uh, so now he's gonna, well, <laughs> and it's because the gun, is, the gun is so heavy, right? So he doesn't really fall backwards, right? But he still, he becomes like a complete ragdoll here. Uh, so let's help him out. 
uh, by making him actually fall backwards. I'm going to add one of the new features in Ragdoll for next release for next week uh, with fields. And uh, Jason's going to touch more on these as well. So I'm going to add a Newton field. And what happens then is uh, you'll get these little arrows drawn on the character to visualize what this field is doing. And the default values is for the field to actually, uh, if I just put the solver on top so it's a bit more clear, uh, you can see that the, the Newton field will sort of attract uh, the, uh, the markers to it. But I want it to repel, so I'll just put a negative sign here. And uh, already you can see that now it's going to attract the whole body. Uh, so if I, if I run this, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's enough to actually make, get him to fall backwards. But it's sort of, he's being pushed every frame, like all the time. Uh, and I just want him to get pushed at this frame. And I also only want him to get pushed at this place, like in the shoulder. So I'm going to add a, a volume to this field. If I just scale it up and have it somewhere here, perhaps. Something like that. And I also only want it to affect him, say, here. So let's make it quite a bit stronger. On the frame before, we don't have any field. There we go. So now when, when the bullet hits, uh, the field activates and he falls backwards. Uh, and then if you increase this even more, you can get like another zero on there uh, to really to really get the effect of that bullet. <laughs> and uh, if I off that, offset the solver again, we can sort of get a look Get a look at look at our, our handiwork and you know maybe a bit extreme <laughs> in this case probably, um, but this is the the general workflow and the way you would work with um, Ragdoll. Uh, you've seen how to uh, affect the simulation and how to get simulation out of it. And um, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Jason, and he's going to show you this, but on a more advanced level <laughs> than what I just did. Uh, so, if I'm doing this right, you should be having Jason on. Whoa, what's up, guys? Um, can you hear me? All good? All right, awesome. Um, so, yes, uh, Jason, I've, I've been an like, animator for like 20 years now, always trying to get simulation into my scenes, like whether it's soft bodies or and cloth or whatever it is and then when i saw the first like like progress on this um on this ragdoll tech it blew my mind it's like that's exactly how i want to animate and this is the future of animation i was just i got super excited and just kind of like dived in you know head first and um yeah i'm going to be starting full time on monday so <laughs> expect more of these really cool um demos i'm going to do a lot more breakdowns um tutorials just you know how to help you guys push push animation as far as far as possible and yeah i'm just going to build on what mark has been showing you guys we got this really cool model um, that antoine um, made he's an incredible modeler we should put his his bio in in the chat somewhere um yeah i saw this model and i was just like i have to i have to animate this and i did my first little test with um with it coming down landing on a branch and yeah, I'm, I'm gonna kind of just run through my process of um, just you know, flying this guy. I, I have a little bit of experience with dragons. I, um, you know, a few seasons on Game of Thrones kind of does that too. You kind of get like a little shorthand for you know, you know, slow down on the flap, fast up. So I'm just gonna do a little quick flight, like the, kind of mimic the one I posted on LinkedIn just the other day. Um, I'm just going to bring this over. I'm going to show you a few stages of, of you know, ragdoll um, spaces. So right now, by default, I've just got him all in world space. So he's just locked to my animation. He's going to match the poses. Actually, let's just get some animation in here. Uh, I don't actually have a rig. This is just joints inside of some uh, some mesh, some skinning. This just kind of shows you the power of Ragdoll. You, you can pretty much, you know, the sky's the limit for, for testing out characters, creatures, proportions. Um, you just put some joints in and then you can get it moving like pretty much right away. So I'm just going to set some random keys, just, you know, some ups and downs for the wings, just to kind of get a feel for, you know, where I need to improve and what I need to add. But this is more just like being very gestural and using these as like actions that are going to ripple into the animation. Uh, yeah, look at that. That's pretty cool. It's flying. I might get a little bit more exaggerated on the way up. I'm going to copy that key all the way back. 
just gonna loop these guys. This looping is super fun. It's free animation over here. Look at that free animation. And uh, if I look at my ragdoll now, it's pretty much matching my animation. There's still some dynamics because you know the stiffness of of the pose is is adhering to my animation as as hard as possible. Like I can go full on match the animation when I go kinematic. So this is just going to be matching exactly what's here. So animators, don't be don't be scared that you're going to have weird worlds of like animation and then dynamics and you can't really control. There's always a way to get back to to the keyframes that you you've, you spent a lot of time putting in there. I'm just going to go dynamic and uh, and then kind of run, run you through you know the different kind of spaces. So right now I'm in custom, which is a nice blend between having my character in world space locked to my, my rig. And then I can just blend it right off into the simulation zone where all the fun stuff happens. Um, but for now, um, yeah, I'm going to kind of keep him yeah, in, in local, which is pretty much him just falling down. And then I'm going to go and adjust the poses inside of um, my rig. Basically, each one of the joints, each one of the, the markers has its own values that um, can be uh, adjusted um, outside of this. So I'm just going to kind of override it. So what do I want? I want to have I want to have the wing support my animation. So I'm going to select those guys, and I'm going to go into the marker. And I'm going to say you're in local space. No, nope. you're in custom space because I can blend you know between you know world and local that way. So if I hit play now, he should try to be you know maintaining some some height he's 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 looking at the animation but still a little bit looser i'm going to do the same thing for the head i'm going to instead of inherit the values from my simulation group i'm going to do custom so i can then blend inside of you know world space and local so i can make them all dynamic or look at my animation more closely and um I'm going to start playing around with the stiffness of my character because right now he's very structured. He's very much matching the pose that I have in my in my um, in my character in the rig. So I'm just going to go to the the group. Right now the pose stiffness is pretty high at seven. So if I put that down to around one, he's going to feel a little bit more you know floppy, a little bit more dynamic. And I'm and already I'm starting to get some nice overlap in the wings. And all I've animated is just the you know, wings up and down. And I'm getting all this really nice follow through and overlap, which I might actually just help out a little bit with animating the hands. So I did the cycle on 20. Yeah. So I'm just going to, on the way down, wings are still holding the air. On the way up, I'm going to just curl them, keep them curled just a little bit. And then flick them out on the way down. Yes, yes, just like that. And I'm gonna then get some free animation. Whoop, look at this free animation. <laughs> uh, okay, so we on the way down. I still want to have him holding the air a little bit more. All right. Yeah, this is starting to feel quite nice. I think I'm still holding on to the animation a little bit too tightly around the arms, but I, I like the rotation that I'm getting in the world space. And this gets a little bit advanced here where I'm actually going to be turning off or turning down the amount of control in translation that, um, that my animation has over my simulation. So what I get right away then is like just get a little bit more, more, more movement in the chest because now the wings are still maintaining its rotation but not so much translation. So I got my character just, you know, just kind of hovering around here. And this is where the fun part comes in, which kind of blew my mind when I did my little test the other day. I'm gonna just put a field, a radial, or no, a uniform field that's gonna act as wind. And right away, I can see he's like pushing over to the side. I'm like, oh geez, the wind is like really hitting him from, from the side. Um, I'm just gonna go negative one in Z. Okay, yeah, that's pretty good. And all these values are keyable, so I can totally like animate the wind change in direction and have a little bit more. And 
no, no, not in that, in y.1.3. There we go. So now it feels like he's getting a little bit more supported by the wind, by the wind. The wind is pushing back. His legs are just a little bit too stiff. I want to have them dangling a little bit more, like loose spaghetti, maybe. So I want to have post stiffness is at one by default. Point one is going to be a little bit looser. And point zero five will be like way, way loose. There we go. Nice. And so I got I got the wind there, but I need some turbulence because this guy is traveling like super fast and you know the wind is jostling and reacting and, and hitting and all that kind of jazz. So I'm just gonna add some turbulence. Where are you? Turbulence. By default, the values aren't really gonna start kicking in too extensively. I'm gonna just crank them up to maybe 100 and see what I get. A little bit of deviation, maybe 300. I like to like, go big and then I can always turn it down again. There we go. Now I'm getting some like jostling over to the side, some hits. I'm going to bring the frequency down or up. Frequency basically is like how many divots and holes are in the noise. So the, the, the larger the number, the more divots you get. And then you take it down to like 0.1 and it's way less. So there we go. I'm starting to see some noise in, in, the, in the membrane. And some movement around the body. I might turn the just get a little bit more magnitude. Yeah, so now my character is starting to feel a little bit more connected to the wind. Again, some jostling. Maybe just turn up the frequency a little bit more. There we go. And then I can add another field. So I have this one that's kind of doing the the small kind of high frequency stuff and then i can just add another field that's going to be a little bit more um, broad so I'm going to turn my frequency to like 0 0.1 whoa too strong <laughs> 100 no no it's sent down 50. it's gonna crash there we go and the wings are really getting pushed back, so I'm just going to increase the post post strength on the wings. Um, right now, they're just at default one. I'm just going to turn them up. There we go. Following the animation a little bit stronger in these sections. I might do it on the upper arms too. Okay, wing the wind might be just a little too high. I'm going to turn this down to maybe. I'm just going to maybe take some of the edge off of some of this noise. Cool. So now he's just battling, battling the wind. The one thing that's missing is uh, let's just get a little bit of movement in my character. I'm not going to really think about too much of what the character is doing. I'm just going to set some keys. And he's going to like fly over to the side, uh, fly back, uh, maybe fly forward, something, something like this. Uh, everyone who knows me and like my animation style, I always keep my translations and rotations separate so I can do stuff like this banked into the translation. And then as soon as I do a change of direction, I rotate into it. So I get like free overlap. And then forward off to the side, and he's traveling backwards. Uh, something like this. Cool. Let's see what that looks like in the sim. Okay, so my character's a little bit looser now. I might just up his strength. Maybe, maybe like five was pretty good. So now he's more contained. He's trying to match the structure of my rig a little bit more. Um, so this is all feeling pretty neat. I might now start going in and adding some characteristics. Like he's going to start looking around where he's going. So I just key that. Maybe look this direction here. And then 
kind of check out this this way. So I'm still I'm still have full control over what's happening animation wise, all the ideas and you know all the um, the emotions and and um, I guess beats, if you will. I still have full control over it. So I'm not like giving away control to the simulation. I'm, the simulation is basically doing all the hard work, all the cleanups and overlaps I would have had to do later. I just have to worry about that now. I'm just setting up the, uh, you know, the essence of what the scene is. Yeah, maybe he doesn't fly backwards as much. It's a little bit unnatural. So I'm, I can already start. Yeah, let's just have him kind of stick around, around here. Um, one thing about flying creatures, they never just flap the whole time. So I'm just going to stick his wings on a, a um, anim layer, an override anim layer. So layer mode, override, and add these suckers. Now this is a pretty good default um, glide pose. So I'm just going to I'm gonna keep it at that. So he's just going to have these wings outstretched now with the, the layer activated. And I can key that on and off into flaps. So I'm just going to key it as a glide for now. He's going to glide off to the side, key that, and then have him start flapping here. A little bit less override, key that. So I'm just keying the weight of the um, of the override channel. And then here I'm going to have him glide again, key that. And then it's going to flap some more. Maybe have that happen slightly sooner. And then I can start finessing these values in, in my weight. So here I can see that his, this is gliding and this is flapping. So I just want to. Let's have that happen just a little bit sooner. Cool. And then what's really fun is I can look at the simulation and use it as a guide for what I can do in my animation. So right now the legs are kind of dragging up. I can accentuate that movement by just kicking the leg out. It's gonna get a little bit higher here. And then here I can bring the, the leg back. So I can still influence what, what the simulation is doing and extrapolate it. Same thing with the tail. I can, like if I don't want to have it being so curled the whole time, I can just select your joints. There we go. So I can kind of start curled. It's going to go off to the side. I want to be a little bit straighter here. Maybe curl inwards. Go back. I'm just going to do some faster little flicks and tail at the end. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Um, yeah, when I'm I'm happy with this, I'm like, okay, I want to see what this looks like on my my actual character on the rig. I'm just gonna go hit record. It's gonna go through and cache everything, and then apply it to my rig, my joints as an animation layer, which I can then render, export, and put into you know a game engine or uh, yeah, just render it, publish your animation. There we go. And then from here, I can just say show none, show polygons. And it's always kind of nice to see stuff with lighting, right, guys? So I'm just going to create a key light like this intensity, density. Just going to give a little bit of a transparent shadow. Shadows. 
a little bit transparent. I'll just add a touch of blue in here. Obviously, this isn't like to do with any sim. It's just a nice way to just see the, the character moving. Uh, I'm gonna move this over to the side, get a little bit of like a nice warm light. Turn the intensity down. And the same thing on the other side, just to get some cold light. Where are we? And then I have my little flying creature battling the wind. And I can just put some cameras in here. And I'm pretty confident it's going to be looking good from every angle. Super fun. And this is all just using my, my animation as like an input. So I can keep refining the animation further, adding more wing beats, more, more head looks, really control what's happening with the feet, add toe curls, define the shape of the tail. And then all the physics goes through and um, just gives this layer of life to everything and it holds everything nice, nicely together structurally. So any, any, any kind of like stretching in the rigs or any kind of breaking, it will just hold that stuff together. So it's like a really good way to just, you know, be, you know maintain um, the structure of your character, stay on model and uh, you know, get this really nice level, level of life to your, to your, to your scene. Pretty fun. Marcus, how are we on time? Should I go crazy? <laughs> see, I'm going to try and cut myself into this stream here. <laughs> so I think people should be able to hear this now. And then we can sort of work from here and thinking through the chat or something. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that was a great deal. Like, yeah, I, I really like this demo. That's why I was very keen on showing this particular Dragon uh, demo. Because, uh, well, also because of the thing on LinkedIn the other day. Because it's a, it's a very cool one. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's have a look at the chat. Uh, I noticed one one from Stefan that I really want to address because that's a good point. Uh, I'll just read it because yeah, so it's, it's captured on video, uh, and it says this is done on simple joints. How well does it work on rigs with animation controls that doesn't really conform that well to the uh, collision shapes? Uh, will there be a lot of custom shapes needed? And I would argue that you could still apply it to the joints of that character. So your animation controls at that point could still be sort of high level. And like a spline IK, for example, and that's one of the things I really wanted to do on the stream, but we didn't have enough time. <laughs> but if you apply it to the joints, there's like uh, Jason has done in his uh, animation here, and then your animation controllers are still sort of high level and affect the overall look of things. Uh, yeah. And then when you record, you would record onto the high level controls, and yeah, you would get the simulation of the high quality joints, but then they will be baked back onto the animation control. So depending on how detailed your controls are. Uh, you would get, well, you, you would get as much detail as your controls would allow. Uh, so to get more detail, you could either well, bake it to the joints and render that, uh, or make more animation controls. Yeah, that's or just the general. Or you can actually um, use the joints as a way to you know do the simulation, and then if these, like say if these spheres were like kind of controls along the arm, I can actually append them onto the simulation. So I can append my IK or my FK controls to the underlying joint structure. So I can select the, the spheres. And if I were to just go edit and say retarget, append, apply, and then exactly. apply. Yeah. So now when the simulation is recorded, it'll be apply. recorded to both the joints and these controllers. Uh, and that's basically what happened with the, the gun. And also there's a tutorial on doing like the IK uh, an IK set up for the mannequin character uh, in the learning material. Uh, that's also the same sort of strategy. Yeah. So right now, those spheres should be getting world space keyframes based on the marker. So it's really good at retargeting. It's like there's a whole another level of ragdoll you can actually potentially use to retarget animation from one rig to another rig that are completely different structurally. Um, <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Lots of tutorials yeah. needed there. Lots of tutorials needed, yeah, but it's, it works for, like, really well. And so now I've, if these were like, you know, pole vectors or uh, twist controls or whatever they, whatever you have in the rig, they will then follow the, um, um, the markers. And you could set markers up as its own, its own entity, like say the, the character you're, you're animating, um, say it's paw or it's hand, um, 
doesn't have a complex joint structure, but the control that you have, you can move around and rotate it and you get some movement in the, in the toes that kind of feels like there should be an underlying joint structure. You can actually define that joint structure with your own joints, make those into markers, and then retarget the control to get the end effector. So you get some really nice connection with the ground and it feels like it's more structured in, in, in the poses. So that, that, that's the super neat thing to like delve into at some point. Yeah. Uh, just looking through the chat and I'm, I'm going to see if we can make it through many questions like it, it cause I'm going to miss a few. So if you, if, cause I'm, I'm scrolling up just a bit, uh, if you have some question that you think they feel that, you know, I missed or that we need to answer, just like post it again so we can see it. <laughs> I'm going to go up about halfway. There's a question about how long, it took, uh, how long <laughs> it took to set the, the dragon up. Cause obviously we didn't show the setup, uh, but the dragon set up. The dragon setup uh, altogether might have been under an hour. It was it was just me drawing joints inside of the inside of the mesh, and then creating these custom shapes was was just me going into Polygon's cube. So I have a nice little cube here, and then increase the subdivisions, and I just turn the geometry. Hang on, I'll do the geometry later. I'm just gonna do the head quickly, so I have. Some geometry here. Just gonna make that zero. Nope, not zero. He's over to the side, man. Yeah, I would set him up as like at the default position, obviously, but um, here it's just kind of like representing the volumes of where the markers are. I'm just looking at the, the skeleton for this. And once I've once I've got you know the whole body kind of laid out, I just select these cubes and say like the, the nose. And I select the geometry and go to deform, shrink wrap. Now I can make this templated. And then I just select these, these bits of, of geo and I can have them fill the volume. And then I use these as custom shapes. I didn't know that. That's very cool. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's super fun. It's, it's a great workflow. Um, yeah, so then I just kind of like have it fill, fill the character's volume here. Yeah. I just delete the history on these when I'm happy with them. This one's a little too late. Yes, yeah, so I just do a pass on that, but setting up a character was you know relatively easy. Like I got hold of this model, um, I think on a Wednesday, and then set it all up, did a few a few little tests, and then I had I had it landing on a branch by Friday. So the turnaround on that was like under two days, and I was just working in the evenings. Um, because I was like, how far can I push this? And by like actually being in the scene, I was I was being surprised constantly on how, how quick it was. But yeah, that's how I set up all of these these geometries and then just uh, did the remesher uh, like Marcus showed you. Yeah. Delete that. Cool. Uh, there's a question of, uh, well, about a UI, because yeah, there's a lot of attributes and especially because we do that sort of a, well, nesting, right? Where you can manipulate the group, which affects all the markers. In this case, uh, the whole dragon is in one. I think it's in one group. Is it? Uh, you can divide uh, yes. the drag. Yeah, you can divide yes. the dragon up into multiple groups. Like the wing could have one, and then you have like sort of these high-level controls over just one wing. Um, and then the solver is like the highest level, so it will also have these uh, stiffness and damping values. So you can control it on sort of a global level. Uh, and those are the three levels that exist. Uh, you can't group groups, for example. So like there will all, always only be three uh, of those levels. But I, as far as a UI goes, uh, what I'd like to do is have more interface in the manipulated UI. Uh, at the moment, you only use it for like the start frame to manipulate the shapes, like I was doing. Uh, but uh, it's going to be it's going to be expanded to do uh, to do quite a quite a f quite a few more things, uh, including things happening during a simulation, like uh, an animation UI of sorts. Uh, to also visualize that uh, nesting to see what what's the final value that I'm actually going to get. I see. I'm looking through I'm the chat. Gonna, I'm just putting, I'm putting a monkey on him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to try that? Okay, yeah. Okay, you can do that while we do the questions. <laughs> um, let's see. It's a question of whether it will work on uh, controls and not just the sort of the bones. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah it, it certainly will. So the first part, uh, I'm not sure if everyone was there, but on the, the first part I was demoing, uh, applying it to the, to the weapon control. 
uh, but then I also use the joints. Joints is a pretty convenient thing to, to use because it's it's almost always guaranteed that no matter what your rig looks like, uh, you will have joints underneath. And they, also, they, all, they always follow your animation control, so they're very consistent. And you can always assign to them and bake back to whatever controls you have. Uh, but especially in the case of having like an FK control hierarchy, then it's safe to just as apply, uh, you know, assign markers straight to the controllers. And that, that's what I'm doing in the tutorials as well for the uh, the mannequin character that I was using. Uh, so yeah, in, in simple rigs, uh, just assign it to the controls. Uh, any more comp, like no matter how complicated they get, you can always find joints underneath or like make your own joints and stuff like that. Uh, the only thing you need is uh, a translate and a rotate channel and then, then it can be simulated. Yeah. Gonna, yeah, one thing you can also do is you can have a whole bunch of these characters already set up and then just reference them in or import the simulation onto a scene. So you could have someone set up a really nice setup like this, then you just import it into your scene. So you don't have to have it while you're working the whole time and just bring it in and you know do the final touches or have the rig already have the simulation um, set up in there. So you can you know, once you've baked it down, you can either remove the remove the dynamics or you know change the reference to only look at the the rig that didn't have have any of the the ragdoll applied to it. But because you've baked it down onto a layer, you still have that animation data. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna connect these two. So right now they're two different um, solves. They're they're not attached. I'm just gonna attach them to each other. So that was was this imported into the scene or like referenced? Uh, referenced. Or? Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, I love referencing rigs. It's, a, it's the safest, safest way forward. Yeah. Link solver. And then as soon as I hit back, where's my guy? Looks like it's been cached as well. Oh, that's right. It's cached at the bottom. It will only update once I uncache. And there's my little dude holding on. So if I hit play now, he's probably going to just, oh, yeah, his body's kinematic. <laughs> <laughs> so his roots is kinematic. I'm just going to say inherit. And let's see if he's going to hold on. No. Oh, gosh. He's dead. Like, you need to hold on, buddy. So I'm just going to put some constraints between his hands. Um, I'm just going to do constraint, distance, maximum. I want, I want this to be like a muscle that's basically holding the hands towards each other. Let's see. Is he going to? He's holding on. He's, he's, he tried. He tried. Um, so I'm going to do another one. The friction is the only thing keeping the. Uh, yeah, the friction. OK, interesting. Yeah. And then I'm just going to attach, maybe attach him. Um, sorry, anyone has it. Yeah, constraint, distance. There we go. I'm going to try and answer some questions. Why hold on tight, buddy. Hold on tight, you got this. Um, there's oh, a question on whether it works with uh, cloth and hair geometry uh, that's driven by joints and controls. Um, not sure I understand which is being driven by which. So if, if you mean, uh, if you had like cloth and it's being simulated by end cloth, say, whether you can use that as sort of geometry for the solver. That's probably not what you mean though, because <laughs> that doesn't, that wouldn't probably make sense. Uh, maybe um, if you can rephrase the question, uh, Ben, and then I can try and answer that more clearly. But what I'm doing with the joints here is I'm kind of like faking cloth. Like I'm using constraints between these joints to keep them structurally together, but they also move independently. So they, they kind of give that illusion of cloth. So you could set up, you know, a, not like a super complicated cloth sim, but um, by just attaching joints together with a nice um, like mesh constraint um, hierarchy, you could you could kind of like emulate a, a sense of cloth. So if someone's wearing a robe or like some um, you know, like a cloak or something, you could have that simulate, and then inside the scene, uh, you can have you know kind of like direct control over it. Right. Yeah. You can uh, you can simulate cloth with ragdoll. So like if these wings, for example, they're probably the uh, you know that's probably close to what you would be looking for with cloth because they are basically soft and sort of connect it to each other and form sort of a flat surface. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Shoulder blades a little bit stiffer. 
there's a question about sort of what joint hierarchy is needed, whether there's anything special going on in that uh, hierarchy that you made. Nothing special. Yeah, it's just a flat. Uh, I'm a, it's a, a single hierarchy. Like there's no requirement on the joints even being uh, parented to each other. You can like skip joints. So a very common thing for like mocap hierarchies, for example, is that you have these extra sort of joints that don't really make anatomical sense, but they're there because of like, that's just the mocap data or twist joints can be there as well. And you can just like ignore them. Like when you assign, like uh, like I was doing for the uh, the mannequin, if you just walk the hierarchy and you skip some, that that's fine. Uh, so it doesn't have to be, you don't even have to assign the markers in the same hierarchy that the joints are in. It just makes visual sense to do that, but uh, there's no need for that. In the solver, there's no concept of hierarchy. Things are independent and connected with uh, with these sort of constraints. So, so the hierarchy is just from Maya. Uh, it doesn't matter what it looks like. All right, we're about 45 minutes in, and now we're going to stick around for another 15 minutes. Uh, I'm still reading through the questions. So if you have any more, just keep posting them. Um, okay, at this point, I'm going to make him, I'm going to just turn off all world space there's a question on how long did it take i guess this is a question for you because i obviously have no perspective on how long things take to learn but how long does it take to uh, to learn what the attributes are doing uh, for you jason I, th I think to feel comfortable is like you know maybe a couple days maybe a week um just to kind of like familiarize yourself with you know how world space works how local space custom space um play with it in your scene um you know get a vibe for it but you know once once you figure that part out it is is astonishing what you can do with it like when am i guys just flying out into <laughs> he's doing a barrel roll um but yeah it's it, it becomes very intuitive after just a few days like once you started playing with it and seeing you know you know um how how stiffness affects affects the, the markers in looking at your animation and then you know getting a little bit looser on those adding some constraints so it's kind of like you build your way up to up to this position but um yeah but once once it's there it's it's pretty straightforward and then with tutorials and you know just you know actively just asking questions in, in the discord you, you can get you can get to like this point within you know maybe two weeks maybe less yeah, we're holding uh, like a Discord server. I think man, many of you probably are there. They're already, uh, but yeah. So look on the on the main website. There's a link to the chat. It's gonna be in the top right corner. Uh, so just click that to join. Uh, yeah, just generally like some of the attributes are new. Like they're not really regular animation attributes, like stiffness, for example. So those are things that they're they're meant to be explored and sort of tweaked and uh, learned by learned by using. And that's how. That's how I'm sort of designing it for you to experiment with it. Uh, so the, the, the important thing is the stiffness and the spaces that you're in, your local or world and stiffness. Those are the three main things. Um, another question is, uh, how many of these values are not default? Like how close would you get to this with just the default out of the box settings? Um, a lot of these are default. Like the only thing that I, I changed was um, it's just the spaces of the arms and, and the head. So it's pretty close. Yeah, the yeah there's not, there's... generally quite high uh, uh, initially. They're meant for you to sort of lower until you're happy with it. Uh, and then the only thing is also the first control that you make is going to be kinematic, so like 100% animation. So that's something that you usually want to turn off. It depends on uh, if you're making a tail, for example, you usually want the root to be still connected to the character, to the lion or whatever, so that the rest can be dynamic. That's sort of the, one of the common cases. Let's go. Um, let's see, a question is about, oh, well, let's see. Uh, how would you add a layer on top of looming, looping gameplay cycles? Um, um. Well, that's a good question. Yeah, there's a tutorial actually I made quite recently. It's on the main website about a, a, a well, a, actually a, a flapping cycle, <laughs> not a dragon, but a, a wasp uh, to show you how to loop a simulation. Uh, and there's really no sort of simulate simulated feature for actually achieving the loop. It's still a matter of finding a loop in the simulation that is close enough in the beginning and end 
so that you can blend them with like regular Maya kinematic blending tools. Because uh, other than that, you would probably use sort of the the world forces that Jason was using here uh, to like at the end just like fade everything towards the world space so that they align roughly with the beginning and then loop it from there. But have a look at the, gonna, the, the tutorial. It covers this. I'm just going to give him a, a tongue. This just shows you how quickly. If you were to have like some custom custom uh, appendages, you could just bring them in and attach them. So it's just going to create a wavy tongue. And I'm just going to make this into right doll. Right now, it doesn't have any geometry assigned to it. So when it caches out, it's not going to. Um, it's not going to have any geometry associated to it, but that's fine. So I'm just going to select the head and I'm just going to go edit, <laughs> reparent it. So now I got this little, little tongue yeah, moving with it. Whoop, whoop. That's right. First joint is always made kinematic, so just make sure you remember that. Wee. Oh yeah, he's got collisions on those. They're quite close to each other. Yeah, I got collisions on here. Uh, one question is about how can this be utilized for simple locomotion of land animals? So assuming like uh, just like a tiger walking, for example. Um, that's a good question. I would say you could. Uh, I can't remember whether there's a tutorial on this, but you can set up a looping cycle, like a kinematic one, and just make all of that dynamic and tweak the values until like the dynamic version of that starts walking on its own. It's a bit tricky. Uh, it's totally doable. Uh, so yeah, I would say experiment with that uh, because that at that point when you have something that's fully dynamic and walking on its own, especially if it's got four legs, because then you don't have to worry about balance as much. Then you can start adding tails and ears and stuff, and that would just like work and also sort of affect the, the locomotion automatically. Uh, so yeah. there's definitely room to explore uh, that. Yeah, and one thing I also found is that, like, say I have animated a tiger running around and doing all that stuff. If I make his his paws more kinematic, so they're looking at the footfalls that I've already defined, uh, and then make the arms a little bit more structured, so they they have a stronger stiffness. But then I have the body be more dynamic than all like the ups and downs and the hits that the arms might get then gets like, propagated into the body and the tail gets like this really nice motion stuff in the neck and then you can make the head look at the animation a bit more. So you can you can feather in, you know, um, areas that you want more simulation in, and then keep the areas that are more like grounded to the ground or that are very um, defined as like these are the places that need to have this action happen and then have everything kind of like, you know, simulate around that. Let's see what okay. I got. I got my little dude hanging on there. Uh, there's a question of whether we can get the scene. Uh, I'll leave that to Jason, whether he wants to distribute it. Uh, not this scene. Um, it's just the, the modelers um, trusted me with this this creature and I don't feel comfortable lending it out. But, um, you know, being full time on Monday, I am also a, a modeler, texture, lighter, all of the above, I'll be making a ton of like custom assets for you guys. So um, yeah, expect expect a bunch of cool things coming. Cool. But yeah, instead of seeing like this. Oh, let's have a look. Okay, so now there's a you he's got King Kong out. holding on, and you got the tongue, and he's doing a barrel roll. <laughs> okay, and he's he's uh, letting go, right? That's like that's because yeah, it's I, too I, strong I of constraints. A... Animated constraints letting go. And he's also being affected by the turbulence. That made his legs nice and loose. <laughs> uh, let's see, there's a question of uh, when the character is in world space, can a character fall to the ground and kick his leg almost like he's trying to walk or move his hand so he's so so that the physics make him crawl forwards? Um, well yes. the thing about world space is that he will be following the world space position of the animation. So if the animation is not moving, it's going to stick to the animation. But I think what you're looking for is actually the opposite of that, for it to be in local space. Because then the character in the physics solver will, will follow the pose of your animation, but be wherever it is 
or you know wherever it would be if it was affected by gravity and you know lying on the ground and actually crawling uh, so that's probably what you what you would look be looking for i'm just going to take kong uh, where is he uh, a question about the difference between the group stiffness and individual marker stiffness uh, so the group is uh, affecting all of the markers it's like it's multiplied together so if the marker has a value of one and the group has a value of 0.5 the total is going to be 0.5 and if you yeah so if you set the group to a low value you would just like make all the markers low uh, and likewise you increase it so it's like a uh, well it's, it's like a hierarchy of attributes it's like if you have multiple things in a group if you scale the group you scale everything together uh, that's what these attributes do so it's meant to give the whole character sort of an, an overall look by using the group stiffness and then tweak individual markers afterwards. I just want to get Kong on the ground. I want to show the example of like the feet. It's going to give his legs a little bit more stiffness. I've turned, I've turned off the, all the, the radials and the, the noise. So he should just fall down. I'm just going to move the solver over to the side. Oh yeah, I got my constraints still holding him. Delete those. Oof. Ugh. All right. So what I can do is I can turn on his, you know, do custom space, go go more in world. So now he's holding true to, um, you know, the control or the joint or whatever you're using, yeah. but. What I touched on a little bit earlier was the um, the strength of the world position in translation and rotation. So I'm just turning the translation off, and now he's going to fall, but he's still trying to maintain this rotation. So if I rotate that, so he's he's still like trying to support himself. So if I you know, angle him up a little bit, maybe increase the stiffness just a touch. There we go. Come on. Stand. <laughs> Stand. And then yeah, just get a little, little bit more stiff to use it, But you, you can get into sort of self balance by using this approach. It's just yeah. following rotations and ignoring the position of your animation. There we go. Yeah. Yes. And this this and will then... answer the next question that I was going to read whether you can use it for like a motorized rig. Uh, like if you have a basically a, an animation cycle of someone walking like this, like Kong, whether you could just have like a physical walk cycle based on this static kinematic mm -hmm. cycle. And that, that this is how you would do it, essentially. Yeah, this is. If I can. Uh, there's a question on how to attach the geometry to the ragdoll. And uh, if you watch, we're going to upload most of this stream, I think. Uh, I showed you how to use the replace mesh function. Uh, it's a matter of selecting what you assigned, selecting what you want to use as a mesh, and going replace mesh. Uh, also, if you assign to the mesh directly, that's going to be the mesh that's going to be used already. Legs are moving. Right. <laughs> He's doing a moonwalk. Is... That's great. <laughs> it's like, yeah, what's up? Arms in the air. Woo oh, man, look at my skinny. I just, I just rigged this guy up like yesterday. Oh, that's great. Yeah, exactly. This is a motorized <laughs> walk right here. <laughs> Yeah, and I can do some some more stuff with like the the knee. So like on the pass through, I can just. So this is great for like little robots and all that jazz. Or what is my cycle on? Frame, yeah. The pass through yeah. frame. There's the question of whether we'll be able to rewatch it, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll upload, we'll upload most of it. I think it's it's gone pretty well. Uh, a question about whether you can get the scene, but without the model. <laughs> What do you think, Jason? Uh, I'll think about it. I'll, <laughs> I'll see. I'll see. I'll see. Um, so maybe I have to like rotate his leg over to the side. There's a request on uh, uh, more short tutorials, and yeah, for sure. Like uh, as soon as when what you know when Jason joins, that's we're gonna do tutorials oh, and, oh, and material oh, like oh. this. Uh, that's gonna he's be gonna do primary it. directive. There we go. He's walking. <laughs> I just need to do it for the other leg. He's like dancing now. <laughs> He's a dance walking dude. All right, so that's 20, 20. 
I think this is That's this cool. is the, this is my favorite part of using physics for animation because you sort of you get these happy accidents, and I want to maximize the amount of happy accidents you can get. Okay, so somewhere around here, I'm just going to kick his leg out to the side so I'm not contacting the ground. All right, so now he should walk and party party on, dude. We we have approached the hour mark. So we're going to try to oh, round man. off. And I'm also at the end of the chat. Uh, if I have forgotten a question, ask it in the chat. Uh, Go do it, Khan. Post uh, the link to the chat just so that we know what I'm referring to. Uh, and then you can ask how many questions you want. Put that here. And, uh, that's gonna be us. I think that's good. I think we yeah. we did it. Yeah. Thanks for joining so, us, guys. Yeah. Thanks <laughs> for joining, and feel free to join the chat. Uh, well, you know, we're we're there, and uh, we'll most likely be doing more streams. So, stay tuned for that. And, yeah. Until next time. Cool. Thanks, guys. See ya.